again, when you have multiple things going on at a time, it's fun because um, you can just keep the flow going. You don't have to wait, you know, a wait a long time. You can just keep moving on from one to the next. So here, I can kind of see how that pushes the form behind because it is opaque and it is still see-through though. So you have, yeah, control over opacity versus transparency. And Pam, if you don't mind, I actually think there's like some relevant questions. Do you mind if I just bring them up? Of course. That's great. Cool. So in particular, the, the ratio, right? I, I know mm -hmm. you talked about the different layers. Can you speak a bit about, uh, you know, the ratio, ratio of the resin to beeswax? Sure. Yeah. I have used um, Joanna, Mater Joanna Matera's book, and it's The Art of Encaustic Painting. And in her book, she talks about, you know, the very traditional eight parts of beeswax to one part of Damar. And I would just say that... Um, I've seen some other artists like they weigh the components to be more accurate, but I was taught just to have one unit of measurement. So it might be like, you know, an empty um, pet food container. Um, that's my unit of measurement. Um, I start out with, I actually melt the Damar resin first, and then just one part might be like an um, eight ounce cat, cat food container. I'll let that melt all the way down, and then I'll, I'll measure eight of the um, beeswax pellets, throw it into the frying pan mix it all up together, make sure the damar melts, and then, then I'll pour it into a mold. So it's actually, you know, very doable, and you can do it in about, you know, less than an hour, make a pretty good amount. And because you go through so much of it, you know, it's, it's a very good way to um, be very economical, just making that. I don't think that, you know, I, I don't make as many paints because... I really do think that RNF um, paints and, and these other ones that are ready-made, you know, um, they just go a really long way. So if you don't mind, you know, purchasing a few and you can usually get them on sale, that's usually what I do. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Uh, another question that came up, I'm going to actually just bring it up, is maximum number of layers you could burn in before the accumulation starts to collapse or degrade. You know, any, any input or insights on this? Yeah, you know, it's funny because like I hear that question um, almost in every single medium, like whether it's cold wax or acrylic and, you know, it, it's not, um, it's not something I really ever think about, uh, probably easily can get up to 10 layers. And it's more, I think the reason why I can't really say is because um, I'm putting it on, but then I'm taking it off. So, you know, you might be at like uh, 10 layers, but then you just take two off. And so it's kind of an addition subtraction sort of thing. And it's um, really only enough layers to get what you want. And that that just can change depending on the painting, right? So that's why it's not like, well, I'm going to do 10 layers today and, and then I'll call it like my painting's done. No, it, it's like my painting could be done in one layer. It could be done in 20 layers or it could be done like in 15 layers. And yeah, I would say that, um, that that's probably true for all the mediums that I work in. So... Good question, though. A very good, good question. I hear it a lot. So, yeah. Pam, I do want to bring up one more question, and I know the answer, but I'm going to make you answer it. Um, just to talk about different mediums. Uh, someone asked, you know, they're getting back into painting after a long absence. They, you know, want to continue using acrylics, and they asked about, you know, workshops classes, suggestions, those type of things. And, you know, I, I know from, from past work with you, PDPC covers that. Did you want to speak to that? Because it isn't just encaustic you cover in PDPC. Oh, correct. In fact, um, okay, so when I first launched PDPC, um, I was, I had to choose some medium to do the 16 paintings. In. And, and again, it's the emphasis in that course is not about the medium. Yes, I'm painting in coal wax and oil, but I have just so many artists in that course who work in acrylic, some work in encaustic, some work in watercolor, like Rachel, who's on this um, the call today. So again, um, the emphasis is really on laying the foundation of art so that you can go and work in any medium. Um, the fact that I'm demonstrating in coal wax and oil, I could have just as easily demonstrated it in any other medium, including encaustic. And so I think that's the point. After I launched the PDPC, you know, I... I had some artists that wanted a little bit more information on acrylic. So then I created an acrylic course and now I'm creating an encaustic course and I'll probably uh, create a uh, monoprint course at some point. 
just for fun. <laughs> so great question. Pam, uh, another question I did want to bring up that, you know, you, we, we, it's kind of the title of the workshop, but I think it's worth speaking to is the approach to play, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I've, in some of your other workshops, you've talked through how play break comes into your work. I think it would be great just for, for folks who maybe this is the first time they're seeing you today. Can you speak a bit towards that? Like, cause pl play for you is an entire, that that's a multiple stages. It's an entire thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting. Um, and the way that I think about play is, um, it's, it's any period of time. It, it, it's not, um, it's not dependent on how long you do it. it. It more depends on, you know, showing up in your studio, getting out something to paint on, choosing a medium, grab some colors and throw it down. If you only did that, you showed up, um, you did your job. That is your job as an artist. And, you know, not everybody is a professional artist or wants to be one, but, we all do want to be productive. We all want to maintain momentum and, and be productive in our lives. So if you can just get your foot in the studio and throw some things around, you're way ahead of, I can tell you that I went through, um, um, got my MFA in grad school and it was very disheartening because um, I took a professional art, artist class with my, my advisor and he told everybody in the class that of all the students who got an MFA, about 90% of them would not continue to make art. And I just thought, wow, I mean, you know, art school is not cheap. Um, education's not cheap. So again, um, I feel that the play stage will get you into your studio. There's, there's no, you can do no wrong. You can make no mistakes. There are no expectations. And if you can really put yourself into the mind of a three-year-old, um, because when you were three, you never thought about results. You never thought about selling work. You never thought about it being beautiful. And um, that just wasn't why you did it. So if you can capture that feeling again, um, it just brings you back into the entire um, joy of making art again. And really, once you start, it's like getting on that bike for the first time. Once you get going and those wheels start turning, it will take you through to the end. But if you don't start, you won't get anywhere. And I think that's what happens to so many people. I've seen it again and again. It happened to me. Um, but I plateaued because I didn't have enough information. <laughs> and I just was frustrated because my results were not consistent. Um, and that's where the color and design um, was the answer for me. And I do think that that is the missing thing for many artists. Any other questions? I'm, I'm just grabbing ones here. <laughs> there's been so there's just so many comments. It's, it's awesome. sorting through. Um, what I do want to grab is uh, keeping track of which cans are opaque, which are glazes, because it's not necessarily obvious when you see them. You know, what? How are you keeping track of this right now? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, well, you know, I I have my tins that I keep heating and reheating every time I come into the studio. And I know like, okay, one thing that about color is that, you know, the cadmiums are always opaque. So cadmium red, cadmium orange, um, French ultramarine blue is known to be kind of a semi-transparent. And so the nature of certain colors, like on the label, it'll tell you if it's transparent or not. But um, the cool thing is you can take any color that's opaque, like, you know, cad red, um, it's an opaque color. But if I add um, encaustic medium to it, it then becomes a glaze. So any color can become a glaze and um, any transparent can become opaque if you add white to it because white makes it opaque. Um, but it's a great question. And, and obviously, if you only worked with opacity in an encaustic, you would be missing out on half of the world of encaustic. So it's very important to understand um, that your colors, um, just as they come in that block like this, you know, from RNF paint, for example, um, if you dilute this out, you get a beautiful, beautiful glaze, but um, full strength, it'll be more opaque. And then there are other things like, you know, these, these are just something new I discovered, um, these gelatos. And I'm, I'm very much into mixed media. So not everything has to be done, you know, with your wax. And that was a huge discovery for me because it's not always easy to get, a, you know, I mean, it's, it's another tin you have to have on your hot plate, but you see how you can, you can, you can add something like that that just nudges that color in, in a little different direction. Here's a blue. So if I go over the gray, 
you know, yeah, I could use encaustic paint, but I could also use one of these and just smear it around. And then again, the addition and subtraction, you have full control over how blue you want that. I mean, I just changed that whole gray. It's different now. So um, it's very much just, um, you know, you, you have a heated palette and you have to determine, you know, how much stuff is on your palette and then decide what paints you want to become transparent and which ones you want to be opaque and, and then kind of just go from there. But like, this is very opaque. You can kind of just see that. And the difference between that one and the quinacridones, the quinacridones are just known pigment classes to be transparent. And so right off the bat, just getting to know your colors. And I do a lot of swatches so that I can actually check the transparency and figure out, you know, where am I at? Because you can't necessarily tell when you're looking at something like this, if it's gonna be transparent or not. You actually have to do like a swatch. And so I've been doing a lot of swatches and that does help. Um, this little guy here, I just wanna show you that I've gouged it and you can probably see that corner. Um, this is one of my favorite techniques is when you gouge it like that and then you fill up the gouged area. And this is paint, I've made it kind of dark like a dark evergreen. This is what I'm doing right now is called intarsia. And I, um, the piece that I have that's on show right now, which is four feet by six feet, um, that whole piece <laughs> was uh, the intarsia. So what happens is you do that and you need to let it cool just a little bit. And I could fuse it now, but I'm instead of doing that, I'm just going to let it cool a little bit and I'll fuse it after I scrape it back. So again, the addition and subtraction, can you kind of see how I dug into there and then I filled it in and then at the right moment uh, of it cooling down, you, well, you can actually, you know, do this at any time when it's really cool, but um, I love that effect. And you have the choice between, I've got a blade here. I could keep going and take all these little bits off or what if I like that kind of residue around the line? And a lot of times I like that, you know, and I'll keep it. So it's just endless. This is just such a fun medium because, you know, look at how quickly you can work. And um, the addition of the multimedia to this for me was like, it, it was a game changer because I was able to get the stronger design that I really wanted. I didn't realize that I could use like pan pastels on this and really change nature so then you can kind of see how in a very short amount of time I've introduced a brand new shape yeah it's really fun Pam what another question I wanted to bring up you know I think that follows up off this is the how you seal your paintings you know I, I know finality is, is there's a lot more that usually goes into this for you but you know at at a conclusion when you're at a point you're ready to stop can you talk a bit about like how you, you seal or finish these paintings off yeah, actually, the, the cool thing about encaustic is that um, <laughs> this is the one medium where there is no um, there's no uh, way that you have to seal it. I want to grab a soft cotton rig, and I'm going to show you real quick. The only thing you have to make sure is that it's cotton. So, um, so I do clean off my edges and you can coat it with beeswax or like I use cold wax medium sometimes just to, to finish that. But on a finished painting, like the wax is it, there is no coating. But when you buff it with a cloth like this, um, you can, I don't know if you can see how shiny that is, but um, that is the beauty of the wax. And you, you, you know, kind of smell the beeswax and it's really nice. It smells good. And um, like with this one, this is just a practice board, but, um, and I did a lot of different effects and mixed media. But again, if you just buff it, the beauty of an encaustic is the fact that there is no coating. There's no varnish. In fact, you can't varnish this. It is what it is. I mean, but that's the beauty. And I just love, this is what I love. When I first saw the sheen of an encaustic, I, I just was mesmerized. I couldn't, um, I just had to learn how to do this and I keep coming back to it, but you can see the sheen. Um, now I can get 
close to this with acrylic. I've learned a four-step technique to do this. My acrylics uh, a lot of times will look like an plastic, but that took a while to figure out too. And then this one has a monoprint worked into the encaustic surface. This was the monoprint here. And then this is a cradled panel. So this again is, uh, I think this one is an ampersand. Yeah, this is made by ampersand, same company, um, the encaustic board. And a lot of times I love working on cradled panels because you don't have to frame them. And again, you can buff these at any time. So I have these in galleries and I'll say, hey, you know, would you mind buffing that every now and then? And so again, that sheen is um, something that is very unique to the encaustic medium. Great question. Pam, I'm gonna keep them coming. Another question was around best brushes for encaustic work. And I've seen some great suggestions in the comments, but can you speak a bit about what you're using? Yeah, um, uh, so I started out with these cheap, cheap chip brushes. Um, that's hard to say really fast. And, <clears throat> but they're like a, you know, they come at, at the hardware store in various sizes and I still use them. But then I graduated to using these hockey brushes um, and they're really not that expensive, but they just have a lovely natural bristle. They come in um, different widths. And when I've worked large, I've got as wide as like six inches, eight inches, 10 inches, which sounds crazy, but you're working out of a frying pan now. You're not working out of a little tin. And if you work large, your, your brushes have to scale up. And so I do list my favorite sources for the hockey brushes on my resource page. And just about everything I'm using here, um, I do list them there because it's easy for me to find them. And I click on it, it it's all linked to where I get the thing. So yeah, good question. Pam, I'm gonna, I got another one coming up. So <laughs> have uh, one of the questions from Judith is, have you used uh, shellac burns or do you use shellac burns? I, I know who, um, who I, the, there's a book, I think that um, this gal, and I think she's one of, she's one of the 26 artists who's doing the master class. And I, I saw her do it and then I tried it. Um, I have done it, but uh, I, I don't tend to, um, uh, I don't know. It, it, it gives a certain effect. Uh, I know there are a lot of artists who also like to use alcohol inks with their um, encaustic and, you know, that's great, but um, these types of things can sometimes produce predictable effects. And I'm, I'm, I'm not about pr prediction. <laughs> I don't want to know what I'm ever going to get. Um, that would just take the fun away from me. So I'm, I'm very aware of it. And I, you know, I think it's a very cool thing. And I think you can uh, find your own way to personalize it. But for me, like, it's just like when you throw salt at a watercolor, I used to do that too. And when I first did it, I thought, wow, that's really cool. And then I started to see everybody else doing it. It's like, oh, well, then I don't want to do it, you know? So I just tried to, um, I don't know. It's just something that I realized with myself. But um, yeah, I do know about that technique. Thank you, Pam. Uh, a question I did want to bring up is from uh, Dominica. And she asked, you know, could you, it, about the self-pacing and like the access around your course. Um, this is a single mom who, you know, she doesn't, she only has a few evenings a week to, to really go through this thing. Um, I know your course is lifetime access, but I figured you'd have a few words you wanted to add. Yeah. And that's, that's why I made it that way because I figure that, um, you know, and this is way well before COVID happened. Um, I launched this in 2018 in the fall and I just thought, you know, basically everything in the course is like, what would I want if I were that student who, um, needed, you know, really wanted to be serious about art, but was a busy person, um, didn't want to have a regimented schedule. And so I, I thought, okay, I'm going to make it lifetime access and you can get in there anytime you want. You just log in with a password and then you see all of my videos and you can track your progress. Um, there's a task bar that allows you to mark a video when you've seen it. And then there are some homework assignments. And then if you're really into it and you want your work critiqued, I now have a master class as well. So many of the people that have joined me today are in my master class. And um, that's when I do a critique of six works every other week. And, and then all of that goes into my library, which now has over 100 hours of videos, um, very much like um, the, the style of my YouTube channel, except that the videos are much longer. And I show you everything that um, 
that is not shown on YouTube. So YouTube is kind of like, here's a little bit of what I'm doing, but my library is like, here's everything I'm doing. And the videos are longer. And then there's quite a few categories. 